Hello, and welcome back to the series where I review crypto and NFT games from the perspective of a gamer. As always, thank you all for your continued support on this series. We are just about to reach 200 subscribers. This will be my last video of the year, as I'm going to be out of town for the next two weeks. But don't worry, I'll be back to my regular schedule as soon as I get back. I'm John, and let's jump right back into our search for the worst crypto game ever. Splinterlands is a play-to-earn NFT card game on the Hive blockchain. Splinterlands was founded in 2018 and along with Gods Unchained, was one of the earliest blockchain digital trading card games. The game's tagline of play, trade, and earn anywhere at any time is plastered all over the game's website. While it certainly sounds like Splinterlands is saying that your earnings are in a real currency, don't be fooled. The actual earnings are in cards, packs, magic potions, and dark energy crystals, which is one of the game's two cryptocurrencies. Not too different than, you know, any other video game where you're rewarded with in-game currency for playing the game. But the deception continues here, as directly above the description of the earnings, they have this figure boasting $6.6 .6 million in tournament prizes awarded. So I'm confused here. Are the earnings in dollars or are they in Splinterlands virtual currency? Reading the fine print here, I learned the following. USD amounts based on market value at time of event creation. So no, your winnings will not be in USD. They will be in Splinterlands virtual currency. The price of the Splinterlands currency is subject to the same manipulation and fraud that all other cryptocurrencies are. So while the value of winnings may appear to be high, this is all assuming that you're actually able to successfully exchange the Splinterlands tokens for a usable currency such as USD. There is nothing legally stopping Splinterlands from valuing the reward cards at $1 million each, for example. They could even create completely synthetic volume on their marketplace via wash trading to keep that $1 million price tag alive. I'll go into this in more detail later, but I wanted to make a note of this now, since the play to earn aspect of this game is going to be mentioned constantly. I haven't even launched the game yet, and I've already started criticizing it. This is going to be a good one. Continuing reading through the site, I find this handy chart to compare Splinterlands to other games. First, we have physical games, which have three negatives. You must go outside to play, trust the US Postal Service to trade, and be a professional to earn. Of course, your earnings as a professional gamer are typically paid in a usable currency, not fairy dust, so this is a pointless comparison. Second on this chart, we have digital games. These can be played at any time and any place, but there's no trading and earning. Again, that's not quite true. You can trade and sell objects in many games, either for in-game currency or for an actual usable currency like US dollars. The Steam Marketplace, for example, supports many games and allows for a safe and generally hassle-free experience for both sellers and buyers. And for the earnings point, since Splinterlands defines earnings as receiving a digital reward for playing, pretty much every game has some form of earning Splinterlands agrees with me on this point too, as even they say that the rewards are nothing more than digital assets with a real world value. By this logic, RuneScape Gold has a real world value too. People sell it all the time. This real world value exists, of course, only if the digital asset market doesn't collapse. Splinterlands even states in their terms and conditions that the price and value of both the cards and the digital currencies could cease to exist overnight should interest in the game fade or some sort of regulation prevent them from existing. But anyway, in the final row of this chart, we have Splinterlands, which is of course the perfect game. You can play it anywhere, trade anything you want, and earn rewards for playing. Now, this chart is silly and every point is easily disproven. Why do these NFT games always have to make comparisons like this? It just makes them look ridiculous. Continuing down the game's homepage, I can't help but notice that Splinterlands' main focus seems to be earning. Very infrequently do they even mention the gameplay. We've already learned that this isn't a real currency, it's just a digital currency that you may or may not be able to exchange for a real currency, depending on demand and liquidity. Let's pause right there though. Why would there even be any liquidity on these currencies? Who is buying them? If everyone gets them for free through playing and the whole point of playing is to earn, why would you be buying the currency? The only way that this economy works is if new players have a reason to purchase dark energy crystals from old players. The real world value of the cryptocurrency and therefore the in-game cards and rewards is solely determined by what a new player is willing to pay for it. The money entering the system from investors or new players is what pays the rewards for the old investors or players. 
And since the rewards are not in USD, they're only in tokens, this all relies on there being enough buyers of this token to actually cash out. Once the interest dies down and everyone goes to sell, only those who sold first will actually make any money. The rewards players get for playing Splinterlands are not derived from wealth that is created, but are instead derived from wealth that has just been reshuffled amongst the players. And besides the Ponzi-nomics here, play to earn is really just working to earn. People who want to play games usually do so because they find it fun. They're not looking to play games as a source of income. And after all this learning about Splinterlands play to earn features, is there any chance that we can actually play to have fun here? I guess we'll find out. Let's play the game. Here on the Splinterlands website, I'm able to create an account and get started playing. Simple. Splinterlands can be played directly in your browser without downloading anything. The good part about this is that it allows the game to be accessed by a wider audience, since anyone with internet access can play, even if they have a slow or outdated computer. However, there will always be a limit to how much a browser game can do, which can limit how much depth a game has. Since Splinterlands is just a simple 2D card game, the web-based approach is probably fine. After creating my account, I'm greeted with a detailed and guided tutorial. This tutorial is the best I've seen yet out of all of these crypto games. To summarize what I learned from this tutorial, Splinterlands is less of a traditional card game and more of an auto battler. At the beginning of each match, you are given a rule set, such as the total mana cost of cards you can use in your deck and which types of cards you are allowed to use in your deck. Then you select your summoner card, build a deck of six other cards that match the element of your summoner card, and press battle. After this, you just watch. Your cards automatically take turns attacking enemy cards until someone has no cards remaining on the field. Cards come in three different categories, melee, ranged, or magic. These categories determine how they can attack. Melee cards can only attack when they are in the front of the deck, and ranged cards can attack from the back of the deck, for example. Cards can also have secondary effects, such as increasing the attack of other cards or restoring health to a damaged card. The player that destroys all of the enemy cards wins the battle. Since the battle is just a simulation, there's nothing you can do to alter the outcome of a match. The winner is determined as soon as you click play. This means that the actual gameplay of Splinterlands ends after building your deck. After watching the battle simulation at the end of the tutorial, I am let loose into the wilds of the Splinterlands. But only seconds later, I received this pop-up asking me to purchase something called a Summoner Spellbook for $10. The Spellbook, as stated on its purchase page, empowers anyone to become a professional gamer. You may now profit from your time playing Splinterlands. At this point, the game offers less depth than Bloons Tower Defense. Does the Spellbook make the gameplay any more interesting? Of course not. It just enables rewards. But John, the Splinterlands rewards have a real-world value. Sure they do but it might be tough to cash out your dark energy crystals for the price you want when there's a total daily volume of $27,000. Don't forget all of the fees, of course. Since there is no exchange willing to swap dark energy crystals directly for US dollars, you'll need to use a decentralized exchange to swap between altcoins until you can get to one that a centralized exchange will trade for usable money. Additionally, since the liquidity here is minuscule, it will only take one large sale to tank the whole market. And lastly, don't forget that there are hackers out there. To do all of the swapping, like I said, you'll need to use a decentralized exchange, which is a common target of a bridge hack. This is just life for me as the world's newest professional gamer, I guess. Everyone knows that members of TSM are paid a salary in TSM bucks. Then, in order to pay rent, they must first transfer their TSM bucks to league tokens using fart swap, then send their league tokens to the poop chain to get some buck coin, which they can then sell with a 10% slippage and 5% fee to finally get the stupid, worthless fiat currency known as US dollars. Anyway, since you can't get any rewards or rank up or anything else without buying the spellbook, there's no point in playing this game for free. Splinterlands should be looked at as a game with a $10 price tag, not as a free to play game. But hey, if the game's fun, then maybe I'll spend $10. With this $10 asking price in mind, I head to play some more ranked matches against other players. Matchmaking is always quick and easy. I never have to wait more than a few seconds. Unfortunately, the game doesn't work properly in Firefox. For some reason, it just skips instantly to the end of the battle, so I couldn't even watch the battle take place until I switched browsers. But regardless, I lost every single game that I played. It's just queue up, pick cards, and then lose. Nobody else is using these trash starter cards, they all have ones that are better in every single way. 
I played maybe 20 or 30 games and literally the only one that I won was one in which the enemy forgot to put any cards in their deck. Now, maybe I'm just really bad, but the clear advantage that the paid cards give is a bad look from a new player's perspective. Splinterlands immediately puts free players against players that have purchased cards, so you're immediately taught that you must do the same should you want to win even a single game. Even if I did purchase the better cards though, the depth and strategy in the game is really deciding which cards to spend money on. In the actual gameplay, you're not so much playing against the enemy as you are playing against the rule set. The player that has the perfect combination of cards to match the most rule sets will win more often, regardless of what the enemy picks. Maybe at the very top of the ladder, where everyone has the exact same best cards, the strategy matter, but for 99% of us, the winner is the one with more money. Okay, so I wanted to record this part while I was editing the video because I remember this really common argument where everyone says that physical trading card games cost a lot of money to get into, so it only makes sense that Splinterlands also costs a lot of money since it's basically a physical trading card game, you know, you own the cards and everything. But I don't think that that argument really makes any sense because when you go ahead and look at one of the top Yu-Gi-Oh decks that actually won a regional tournament, you'll see that the deck price was only $158. But Splinterlands, on the other hand, if we look at one of the decks used by one of the highest ranked players, we'll see that this deck value was about $565. And here, you're only getting 7 cards. Plus, they're not even real cards that you can use in real life. So, in the end, I think this argument is kind of silly. Yes, both games have very overpriced cards. But there really isn't a reason why the digital cards should be costing more than physical cards. Anyway, back to the video. Splinterlands, at this point, has not convinced me in the slightest that it is worth paying $10 for. Now, you're thinking, John, you're just being negative because you don't want to spend $10 on the game. You have to pay to earn, you know? They can't just give people money for free. And you're right. I don't want to spend money because $10 is too high of a price tag for a game with the quality of a 2007 New Rounds Flash game. A game should be fun before it goes and asks for a price tag of $10, and Splinterlands is not a fun game. It is nothing but a money fight simulator. But I'll stop being negative and let's explore what happens when I purchase the spellbook. With my $10 purchase of the Summoner spellbook, I am now allowed to buy, trade, own, rent, earn, and manage my digital assets in Splinterlands. I can also earn rating to rank up in the ranked game mode, as well as earn rewards proportional to my in-game rank. Splinter Shards, also known as SPS, are the cryptocurrency tokens rewarded whenever you win ranked battles in Splinterlands. SPS cannot be used to buy card packs, buy cards from the marketplace from other players, or to rent cards though. To do those things, you'll need the game's other cryptocurrency, Dark Energy Crystals, or DEC. As far as I can tell, there is no way to directly convert SPS to DEC through the official Splinterlands website, so you'll need to go through a third-party exchange to do that. In addition to DEC and SPS, there are also credits, which are not a cryptocurrency. You can use credits to buy or rent cards from the marketplace, just like you can with DEC. But the only way to get credits is by purchasing them with PayPal or a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ethereum. And looking at the accepted list of cryptocurrencies, neither DEC nor SPS are accepted to purchase credits. DEC has an approximate USD value of $0.0007. This is the token with the exceedingly low liquidity that I mentioned earlier. Splinter Shards are the game's governance tokens. In addition to earning them from completing ranked battles, you can also get them from airdrops, as staking rewards, or through purchasing them with another cryptocurrency or US dollars. Not DEC though, of course. However, it looks like the only way to sell your Splinter Shards for USD as a US citizen is by using a decentralized exchange. There are no centralized exchanges that operate within the United States that allow exchanging SPS for USD. It's almost like our government is trying to protect us from something. So, as a US citizen, unfortunately, your trading will have to rely entirely on the decentralized exchanges that have very small liquidity pools, no matter which of the game's two cryptocurrencies you choose to trade. The biggest reason to have Splinter Shards is to get access to staking rewards, which are paid in the form of even more Splinter Shards. With this staking feature, you can stake your Splinter Shards on certain players, including yourself, where you are then rewarded with more Splinter Shards when the player wins. Splinterlands provides the following helpful chart for you to determine your rewards. Wow, 360% return on investment? That's entirely realistic, believable, and not indicative of a Ponzi scheme at all. 
Staked Splinter Shards are not liquid and may not be transferred or sold. Staked SPS tokens may be unstaked over a period of 4 weeks, with 25% of the total amount of staked tokens becoming liquid every week. This time frame was carefully chosen by the developers to ensure that a rapid crash of the market was less likely, as it takes a minimum of 4 weeks to fully cash out staked Splinter Shards. And since Splinter Shards pretty much don't do anything unless they're staked, almost all Splinter Shards will inevitably be locked up in staking. This helps to keep the price from falling, as there is an incentive not to sell. However, this hasn't really worked, since the price of the token is down over 97% on the year. Similar to Gods Unchained, players that are higher ranked than Splinterlands earn more Splinter Shards for winning. Players must be ranked above Bronze 3 to be eligible to earn Splinter Shards, but it's not that simple. While you may gain ranked points for winning a game, your rank will be capped based on how much collection power you have. For example, you will not be able to proceed past Bronze 1 unless you have over 5,000 CP, no matter how many games you win. Collection power, as explained by Splinterlands themselves, is to limit the maximum league of ranked play based on the extent of a player's card collection. This encourages players to grow their collections proportionally to their skill as they advance in leagues, as well as to limit the potential for highly skilled players with small collections to earn the same top tier rewards as players with decks that cost them thousands of dollars. I have two problems with this. First, they're admitting that the cards are not balanced, and the more expensive cards are too overpowered to be allowed in the same league as the cheaper cards. And the second problem is that they're admitting that this is a pyramid scheme, since the players at the top are guaranteed to earn more money than the players at the bottom. But at these lowest ranks, the rewards are so small that you won't be able to earn enough to buy the cards you need to increase your CP. Therefore, you are encouraged to invest more money to move yourself up on the earning pyramid. And no matter how good you are, if you haven't spent enough money on the system, you literally cannot increase your rank any further. As an additional incentive to buying cards to raise your collection power, you can rent your own cards out to other players and collect a daily fee. This helps feed the pyramidal structure of the game's economy, as the players at the top rely on new players coming in to rent their cards to help them recoup their investment. When the new people inevitably stop renting or purchasing cards from the early players, the pyramid will collapse and nobody will earn anything. The game lures you to spend more and more money by promising increasing rewards the higher rank you get, all with that stupid real world value label attached to the prizes. You are giving them your real usable money in exchange for fake unusable reward money. To make things even worse, Splinterlands also offers virtual land and JPEG NFTs. Of course, Neither of these investments have any utility, so good luck trying to dump your bags on a greater fool than yourself. Despite all of this, Splinterlands is the second most played NFT game according to DAP Radar, with over a quarter million unique wallets interacting weekly. However, as you can see right here, the weekly volume is only $8,000. Are people really playing this game? Simply put, no. Nobody is playing this game. An exceedingly large majority of Splinterlands players are nothing more than bots with estimates saying as high as 90% of the population is a bot. In fact, pretty much every single player that I played against was a bot. Since the gameplay is so simple, it makes sense to set up 5 or 6 bots that will constantly play the game for you, so you can earn rewards without even having to be at your computer or play the game. In fact, botting isn't even against the rules, it's actually allowed and encouraged by the developers. Besides, each new bot means that Splinterlands is making $10 in cash from the spellbook fee, and it keeps their engagement numbers high, so why would they ever want to ban the bots? Of course, Splinterlands doesn't even accept their own cryptocurrencies for the spellbook purchase. They know the true value of their play to earn rewards. But how would you even make money botting this game? To make money off of the rewards the bots get from winning games, you still have to sell the tokens. But with such a low liquidity, I really don't think a majority of the players that are running the bot farms are even cashing out. It's always very hard to honestly discuss profitability with crypto investors. They will gladly show you their 400% returns, but most of the times, the returns are just in some obscure, illiquid token. And even then, with the amount of swaps and conversions needed to cash out, you're going to eat fees left and right, not to mention the slippage due to the low trading volume. I would be willing to bet that there are less than 100 unique individuals using the play-to-earn feature in Splinterlands today that are actively taking a profit in USD. 
a vast majority of players most likely just sit with their earnings as worthless SPS tokens while they continue to dump more and more US dollars into the game's economy to make line go up. Players are lured in through advertisements of earning money through playing, only to soon find out that they will need to invest hundreds, sometimes even thousands of dollars just to compete with the magnitude of whale-run bot farms. There's hardly anyone actually playing this game for the sake of playing, and that point alone indicates that the game part of Splinterlands is a failure. For an NFT game to be successful, it needs to attract players outside of the cryptosphere. And for the pay to earn model to work, these new players need to also be adding money into the system since it is nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. I'm viewing these games from the perspective of a gamer, not a crypto speculator. And from that perspective, Splinterlands offers nothing. After my time spent playing and researching Splinterlands, my long-term outlook for the game is bleak. Splinterlands recently laid off nearly half of the company and the game's token value has plummeted 97% this year. The game's official YouTube channel has less than 4,000 subscribers and averages less than 1,000 views per video. The only people who care about Splinterlands at this point are bag holders. Splinterlands recently had a convention and tournament in a casino in Las Vegas. Tickets were $300 for general admission and $2,000 for VIP admission. Here's a clip from the final match of the tournament. I've said enough about Splinterlands. This game, if you can even call it that, is the embodiment of how crypto and NFTs and gaming are solutions looking for problems to solve. If you don't care about crypto, you won't care about Splinterlands. With my gameplay analysis of Splinterlands complete, it's time to go over the game with my five point review system. Point number one, ease of access. Splinterlands is easy to access. All you do is visit the website, log in and play. Additionally, it is available on both desktop and mobile devices. However, there's really no reason to play this game unless you're willing to spend $10. And once you've spent that $10, you'll only have enough collection power to play in the lowest of ranks, where the rewards are practically nothing. You'll need to spend additional money if you want to rent or buy cards and continue to rank up. If you really love the gameplay for some reason, you'll still need to get into the crypto economy of the game to fully enjoy it. And with that comes a mountain of research. And be careful, you can't ask anyone for help since there's a high chance that they're just trying to scam you. Remember, do your own research. I gave Splinterlands a 1 out of 5 on ease of access. While it's easy to launch and play the tutorial for free, you really won't be able to do anything else unless you're willing to spend money. And even if you do want to spend money, it's quite a high cost of entry for the quality of game that you're getting. Most gamers wouldn't buy this. Point number 2, the graphics and audio. Splinterlands is pretty much just a flash game. The card art style is reminiscent of clip art, and there really isn't a cohesive theme, it's just random fantasy creatures and characters. 90% of the time, I didn't even look at the card name, nor the artwork, it's all pretty much meaningless. Because the game is just an auto battler, even if the cards did have animations, there's no incentive for you to watch them. Most players don't even play the game at all, they just have bots playing it for them. It's nice to watch the battles to see why you lost, but still, the vast majority of the time, you're not going to be looking at your battles. The audio is similar to the graphics, quite bad. The few songs that the game does have constantly play over top of each other, so you'll frequently have two songs playing at once. Additionally, the game's volume is so loud by default that the levels were clipping while I was recording an OBS. I gave Splinterlands graphics and audio a 1 out of 5, because at least the game has audio and visual, I guess. Point number 3, the gameplay. Splinterlands is an auto battler. That means you pick cards that adhere to the rule set at the beginning of the battle and then you watch a simulation to see who wins. The game is extremely pay to win. Better cards almost always guarantee a win. Additionally, you cannot rank up past a certain point unless the monetary value of your collection also increases. Because of this, the top of the ladder is guaranteed to be exclusively whales. Skill matters very little in this game, as even if you did win every single game, you will not be able to rank up unless you also purchase cards to increase your collection power. While there is certainly a strategy to winning, it's not very deep. Plus, since you're mostly going to be playing against bots unless you're at the top ranks, you're best off just researching the most common bot decks and then playing whatever beats them. 
I did not have any fun playing Splinterlands for free, so there's no reason for me to spend $10 since it won't change the base gameplay. After all of my time spent with Splinterlands, I had played almost 50 games, and out of those 50 games, I only won one. I thought that I had just sucked at the game, but after reading some forum posts, it seems that the common answer to this question is that you will never beat one of the bots until you buy the cards that are strong enough to beat the ones that the bots have. I gave Splinterlands gameplay a 0 out of 5, because the ideal way to have fun playing this game is to not play it at all. Point number 4, the value of NFT and crypto. This game is only crypto. It couldn't exist without it. If the crypto was removed from the game, it would be looked at in the same way that a Flash game is. There's no way that they can charge $10 for this in 2022. Crypto enables unregulated pay-to-win features with loot box gambling, and the main reason for anyone to ever interact with this game is to earn and trade unregulated securities. And besides, the liquidity on these tokens is so low that you'll have a very difficult time exchanging your rewards for a usable currency. For this category, I gave Splinterlands a 0 out of 5 because crypto once again manages to ruin what otherwise could have been a decent game. Point number five, will this project succeed? While Splinterlands is the second most played NFT game by user count, that matters little since 99% of the player base could be bots and there's no way to prove otherwise. The low volume on the tokens indicates that there are not a lot of people actually buying or selling the token and since watch trading is completely allowed in crypto, even that little bit of activity could be fake as well. I really don't see how this game could be anything but a Ponzi or Pyramid scheme. New players must pay $10 to enter and are promised higher rewards the more they invest in cards. But in the end, the money that the new players invest is only used to pay for the rewards of the players who are at the top and got in early. Additionally, there seems to be almost no organic interest in the game itself, as its YouTube channel, which has many high quality videos explaining the lore, gameplay, and more, has barely 500 views per video. Even the players don't care about the game, they just want crypto. And lastly, Splinterlands just laid off almost half of its entire staff. That's never a good sign, no matter how they try and spin it. As far as long-term success goes, I give Splinterlands a 1 out of 5. Splinterlands will never be a mainstream game, and will only continue to decline in popularity over time. It's a pyramid scheme at best, and a Ponzi scheme at worst. My overall score of Splinterlands is... 12 out of 100. Atrocious.